Good afternoon. Those of you that don't know me, my name is Austin Check. Uh, I work here in human resources management. Uh, outside of that, which you're thinking is kind of weird that human resources management has anything to do with fire safety. I uh, participate on the campus uh, community emergency response team. Uh, and I've also been in public safety for nearly 15 years and I'm an adjunct instructor for the State Fire Academy. So uh, obviously a subject I'm really comfortable with. I appreciate you coming in here, taking the time to learn about today. We'll stay in here for just about an hour. Uh, then we're gonna go downstairs out front of the union to the uh, smoke, uh, excuse me, fire extinguisher trailer and we'll do some exercises there. Um, you're not gonna get dirty, but did anybody in here violate the rules about not wearing heels or some kind of footwear you can trip in? Uh, if, if, if you are wearing something like that, we can accommodate it. Just be careful stepping in and out of that trailer is the, is the big thing to take home there. But um, So anyways, we're in here to talk about fire safety, not just uh, in, in the home, but also in, in the workplace. You know, the basic things we're going to talk about today, basic fire chemistry. There will be a test at the end. I hope you all remember how to write uh, your chains and so forth like that. Uh, <laughs> The, the common hazards that we see in the home and the workplace, uh, the size up if you're going to actually try to extinguish a fire, keeping an idea of your surroundings and what's going on with you, uh, the actual resources that you actually have to put that fire out, uh, and then the safety with it and applied skills, which will be going downstairs to the trailer. Uh, the second little part we'll talk about, and Russ will come down here in a minute, is just basic first aid for burns. Um, a lot of this is going to be somewhat repetitive. I just want you to know that most of the time, a lot of this comes from people that just get real, um, they get used to just being comfortable. You get a little lazy about cleaning up at yourself, or maybe you buy something a little bit cheaper than what you should have. And that's where we see a lot of fires come from. So what are we here? Um, in 2014, this is the last year we got really good numbers. Uh, there's about, when we talk about a structure fire, that can be anything from a little kitchen fire. It gets put out with, uh, baking soda all the way up to the house burns to the ground, and we're looking at about 370,000 fires. Uh, of that, you had uh, 2,745 deaths and close to 12,000 injuries. Uh, the other thing there being about $7 billion worth of damage. Uh, on average in the U.S., you do see about seven people die per day in, in structure fires. Uh, you have very limited time, and I'm going to show you a video here in a moment just to really exemplify how much people, you, you see it on TV and you see all these shows like uh, Rescue Me and Chicago Fire and those of you that are old enough remember the movie Backdraft. You cannot be in something burning and have a conversation with somebody right here. It does not work that way. I want you to get that out of your head right now. It's great for television. It is not practical in real life whatsoever. <laughs> and that's the, the biggest thing we run into is people don't take this stuff serious and I kind of think that's the way we've been indoctrinated as far as the entertainment sector and so forth like that. They portray it in a very different manner. If you did a television show on actually being inside a house fire, it would fail immediately because you can't see anything. You'd be better off doing it as a radio show. Uh, there's always ways to enhance safety and lessen the risk for you and your family. You can't plan for everything. I understand that. I get that. But we can take basic steps to ensure that, you know, we've taken care of about 80%, 90% of where the problems could come from. All right, so I want to start out with, this is an example. This is called the Station Nightclub Fire. Does anybody remember this? It's about 2003, so it's very recent. And you see the numbers up here. There were 100 fatalities, 230 non-fatality injuries. Uh, Y'all may also know it as the, where the band Great White tried to play. Uh, this fire started at the very first song that that band played. It's not like they'd been in there forever or anything like that. I mean, it was the very beginning of the performance. So obviously, this was a very interesting thing to study if you're a fire investigator. Uh, this is certainly material that's put out there now. Uh, the federal government, which is NIST, is a part of, went back and recreated this fire. You know, kind of built it the way the stage was within controlled conditions. The stage, the materials, so forth like that. I want to show you how quickly things like that can turn. And keep in mind that this is a very open area uh, when you're talking about a nightclub versus like your home, or your office or something like that where the ceilings are lowered. Let's take a quick look and just watch the time here. So this is where the actual ignition started. I want you to see how quickly the fire doubles. And then I want you to start watching the smoke. 
The thing I want you to understand about smoke, one, it's unburned fuel. That's what smoke is. The darker it is, the more fuel that's still in it. Um, if it finds an oxygen source, especially in this setting here, it will ignite on its own. Uh, it just does not have an, enough oxygen to burn. See that black smoke? If you had enough oxygen right there, that stuff would be burning on the ceiling right now. It's also superheated. When you hear people, people say somebody died of smoke inhalation, it's not that they were standing up breathing and they just didn't get enough oxygen. We're talking about searing the lungs from the inside out. All right, we're at 50 seconds here. Look how much smoke is starting to build up. I want you to pay attention now between this point and one minute and 30 seconds how much that smoke really comes into play here. This camera is at ground level where we're talking about telling people to crawl on the floor to get out. This is the reason we tell them this. Remember, a much larger area than what you're normally going to be in within home, office, classroom, what have you. The flames are spreading there, that's auto ignition. That's just the temperature has heated those materials to the point that they spontaneously combust. There's not like an extra fuel there or anything like that. One minute, 30 seconds. So I, I know what you're saying. Well, you know, I could get out of that room in a minute, 30 seconds. If I saw something like that burning, that would not be a problem for me whatsoever. And that's true if you're the only person in that room. Add a bunch of people in there. Um, and you get something different. So we're going to go to the video now of the actual station nightclub fire. Before I play it, I want you to understand why this video exists and it was something really extraordinary. There was a TV crew that went in this club to do a documentary on nightclub safety when this happened. That's why they were there. That's very ironic and it was one of the first times that you caught something with this much devastation on film from beginning to end, uh, which obviously helped with the investigation and so forth but to document the reason why so many people died. So we're not going to see people burn up. We're, we're, we're going to stop the video long before that. But I just want you to understand and, and keep in mind how quickly this gets out of control. And ignition starts, if you see it in the corner there. I mean, we're 15, 20 seconds, even the band doesn't realize what's going on behind them. TV crew's getting out, they know what's going on. All right, when that fire alarm sounds, that's the first time the 911 center is getting notification this is going on. So remember how quickly the fire spread in the other video? We're 30 seconds in before anything ever notified 911. So the smoke's starting to bank down before they could even get out the door. It's at 1 minute 30 seconds, so remember what it looked like on the dance floor at this point. That's one exit right there, where everybody's trying to come out with one spot. So now you have people breaking windows trying to get out. And while that certainly gives a few of them an escape, now you're introducing more oxygen into that fire. Remember what I said about smoke when it gets more oxygen? Two minutes, this thing's completely falling apart in less than two minutes.
Notice under his nostrils where it's so black, that's smoke inhalation. At this point, it's kind of hard to hear, but you can start to pick up the sirens in the background when the fire department's getting close to arriving. I know you're thinking, where's the fire department? I just want you to understand, it took 30 seconds before that thing rang the 911 center. The 911 center has to pull down the information. It's after dark, um, so most people are still gonna be in bed, so is the fire department. They've gotta hit the button, dispatch the call, the fire department getting up, they're getting the trucks, they're pulling out the building. It's not at 30 seconds and somebody's at your back door. Uh, they have a fantastic response time. Uh, you can hear them now getting closer. Under five minutes and something like this is absolutely amazing. Whether you're in a rural area or a municipal area, um, it, it just takes a minute to get that information in. Uh, it, even now, it gets a little confusing because with everyone having cell phones, you'll get multiple calls, different kinds of information. I, I just really want you to understand that it takes a minute for outside help to come in. Uh, you can see where this fire is starting to vent through the back. It's burned through the wall. Uh, and I'm pretty much going to wrap it up right here in five minutes. That's the stage. I don't show you this to scare you. That's not my point. I'm not trying to, to drive home that you're going to get hurt. I just want you to understand when, when we say, well, everybody's going to act rationally if something like this happens. That's not the case. This is reality. As plain and as clear as it can get, this is what happens. A person is smart. I hate to say it. People are dumb. That's the truth. And we all have the best hopes and we hope everyone has the best of intentions. But we've challenged from rational thought here to fight or flight. In this case, it's flight. Where this really gets unfortunate is how this ended up happening. No one died in the room where the stage was. This, excuse me, this one person, if I'm not mistaken, one of the guitarists from the band left, realized his guitar was still in there and tried to go back in and it killed him. That's the one. The majority, that doorway you saw where everybody was crammed in, was where, where they perished. That everybody was going for that one exit. Now this building did have marked exits all around. You can see two here. Another one's here by the stage. I mean, there's several exits, but everybody paid attention to that one exit. And that's what they went for. Uh, these people right here were basically had gotten lost trying to get to that exit. These back here tried to hide from the fire. That's what happened. There were plenty of exits for all these people to get out, but they made poor choices. Why did they make poor choices? Because they didn't spend time up front to think about, what am I going to do if this goes wrong? They all tried to figure it out as it went along, and unfortunately, 100 people paid for it with their life. That's what brings me to escape plans. Within your home, your office, wherever, it can be on paper, it can be on your mind, you need to have an escape plan. In this room right now, there are two exits. There's a door there, and there's a door right here. If we went out in this corridor, we have two ways that we can go. We can go down that staircase there, or we can go all the way to this end and that, go to that staircase. There are multiple places to go. But if you don't think about that on the front end, you're going to go exactly the way you came to get in this building right now. And so is everybody else. And that's what, exactly what happened up there in Rhode Island. Only a third of people actually think about this, plan this. Those of you that have children and so forth, you have multi-level homes, 
Have you ever thought about the fact that if something happened on the first floor and you're on the second floor, how are you going to get out? There's certainly ways. It's a lot safer if you've thought about that before and planned for it versus waiting for the fire department to get there and hanging out a window. You know, that's a way to do it. That's not the best way to go about it. Think about these things up front. Does it take a lot of time to do this? No. Does it cost a lot of money to do this? No. We just get complacent and we don't do these things. And that's what hurts people in the long run is the complacency. All right, so let's take a little quiz here. Every home needs what? A working smoke alarm, a working smoke alarm on every level, a home escape plan, or all of the above? Obviously, this is a federal curriculum. It's always going to be all of the above. <laughs> it's, if you ever take a test, it's given by FEMA, and there's all of the above, all of the above, okay? They're going to see this video on the Internet and change that policy. Leading cause of home fires. Who thinks it's cooking? Raise your hand. Electrical? Heating? Smoking? Y'all going to be like, oh, that's why they put the smoking ban in at campus. It's cooking. Over half the fires, residential now, residential fires in the United States start in the kitchen. It's either through someone goes a little bit beyond their skill set or not enough attention or somebody knocks a pot over something. Yes, sir? I rest my case. <laughs> I'm not knocking on. Yeah, I mean cooking fires, but I mean, why is that? Because that's where we're doing the, the most risky activity in the home. Uh, you know, electrical fires. Everybody blames electricity. Very rarely is it actually an electrical problem that starts a home fire. Uh, heating is a lot safer than what people think. Even space heaters, if you knock them over, they turn off. If you get them too close to something, they turn off. Um, Smoking, obviously, we have a lot of materials now that if you look at the tags, they've been rated for fire. That's to prevent people from burning up if they drop a cigarette when they fall asleep. So really the only one that we really can't improve that much is cooking because either you're on a hot eye for an electric stove or you're over a gas range. There's, there's really not a better way to go about that. So, you know, we're talking about priorities and context. And this is the CERT curriculum, by the way, uh, the Community Emergency Response Teams. Uh, this is probably a horrible way to put it, but if you're wondering really what CERT is, think about like the neighborhood watch, but for disasters. Like you, you within your neighborhood or here with, on campus within the community, people that have other jobs and other things to do, but in time of crisis can come together and, and help out with basic knowledge. And so that's where we pull from this curriculum. Your safety is number one. And I know you're thinking, well, that sounds ridiculous. How, you know, that's not very heroic or anything like that. Okay, we call people heroes when they die. Um, if you are injured and you're hurt, you can't help anybody else. That's why your safety is number one, okay? If you're not okay, you have absolutely no chance of helping anybody else, and now somebody's got to help the person you're going after, and they've got to help you as well. Uh, you, you become part of the problem, not the solution. Uh, in the CERT curriculum, we do two people teams. You know, one person's working the extinguisher, the other one's making sure that we haven't lost our path of egress. Uh, that, that we're not backing up and tripping over things. Two people is always better than one. Safety in numbers. It applies here just as easily. So we have the fire triangle. And is anybody in here on a volunteer fire department or anything like that? Okay, they've really tried to church it up in the last few years and they call it the fire tetrahedron because it makes you sound smarter. Uh, I still, when I went to the fire academy, they call it the fire triangle. I'm going to stick with what I know and call it the fire triangle. Um, but basically, the three sides, if you remove one, the fire can't exist. If you subscribe to the tetrahedron, then the fourth one is the, the chain reaction. We'll just call that fire and leave it as a triangle, okay? Um, the different ways that we extinguish things. So the fire department does a little bit different than what you do in your home. When the fire department comes out and they spray all that water all over the place, okay, it's not removing oxygen, it doesn't remove the fuel, it's cooling it down to the point there's not enough heat to generate the fire. When you use a fire extinguisher, you're not removing the fuel. Uh, rarely are you removing the heat, but you're removing the oxygen. You're basically blanketing the thing. Uh, and then when we're talking about removing the fuel, uh, a good one that I use to explain to people is if you live out in the country and you've ever had a grass fire or something like that or forestry came in, they cut that line with the bulldozer, 
they're removing the fuel. They let the fire burn up, it has no more fuel, and it puts itself out. So three different ways to attack a fire, all with the same premise that you're just cutting one of the three legs out from under this thing. So we have different classes of fires. We have ordinary combustibles, that's your paper products, uh, your like campfire, the wood, so forth like that. That's the thing that we're normally used to. Uh, flammable and combustible liquids, that's your gasoline, diesel fuel, lamp oil, kerosene, what have you. Uh, C is energized electrical equipment. Very, uh, very important to say that we're, we're putting it as energized here. The power's still on to it. When you turn the power off to this stuff, it becomes something else, obviously. D is combustible me metals. Um, that is like your, uh, oh man, I dropped the ball the other day when I said this, uh, magnesium. Magnesium is, is a good example of it. They used to put that stuff in Volkswagen Beetles. I know for a fact it's in late metal Grand Prix cars. Uh, if you spray water on a magnesium fire, you'll see the biggest light show you ever had. You just better hope that you're far enough away from it when it happens because that stuff flying out will burn straight through you. Uh, and then the final is the cooking oils, and that's in your restaurant. So most of the time we see fire extinguishers as an ABC extinguisher, right? ABC extinguisher is good for everything. It's not great at anything, but it gets the job done. Uh, when we get to combustible metals, it won't work, right? Because the combustible metal almost generates its own oxygen. So blanketing it with something doesn't work. Spraying water on it does not work at all. Uh, and so we have to have a different source of extinguishment for that. And then cooking oils is another one, uh, especially in restaurants and so forth like that, where they have the hoods, uh, they have the different nozzles hanging. That's going to be a different chemical because it's designed specifically for that one fire that's going to exist. Hi, my name's Russ Garner. I work with the Mathis Sales Store, otherwise known as Cheese Store. So if you're looking for cheese, come see us. Uh, I also have 13 years in the fire service, although uh, not as sexy as Austin's service. I uh, was a small rural fire department. Uh, I can say we saved a lot of chimneys. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, uh, kind of go over some things here with the, uh, the quiz, the fire safety quiz. If your smoke alarm chirps, uh, you should uh, clean it using the uh, vacuum hose, clean the battery, and then test the alarm, then replace the alarm, test the, and test the alarm. Of course, we've already, uh, what's that going to be? Replace the battery and then test the alarm. Um, half of home fire deaths happen between when? It's going to be a, a that's right. What's happening in between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m.? your sleep worst time um, some risks from kitchen fires <laughs> never leave cooking food unattended if you must leave you got to turn off the uh, stove and you, you got to keep an eye on what you fry uh, you want to check that food regularly when you're cooking um, if you're like me sometimes you want to do something go you're trying to uh, to uh, multitask the best thing is look you know watch your your what you're cooking uh, of course, you need to use a timer. Um, don't wear loose clothing or dangling sweets while cooking. Now, uh, what's that, what, why, why would you not do that? Catch fire. Catch fire, exactly. Uh, you want to keep the kids at least three feet away from the stove. I remember back uh, a long time ago, the big thing was uh, keeping the handles away from where the kids could knock them out. Uh, by habit, I still keep it turned inwards. Uh, I mean, if I'm not even cooking, I'm going to walk by. I'm going to turn that uh, handle back in. Uh, you want to keep the items that catch fire and flammable liquids away from the stove or oven. you got to uh, you know, clean those cooking surfaces regularly. My wife gets on to me a lot because I'm not as good a cleaner in the kitchen as she would like me to be. So uh, that's one thing you got to uh, watch out for. You want to keep, always keep a fire extinguisher in and within reach of, the, of your kitchen. Uh, it's no good if it's in your storage room under uh, a duffel bag behind the spare tire. It's, it's no good. So keep it always uh, close within reach. Um, at night, I always check the kitchen to make sure appliances are off. Uh, every morning I cook breakfast, but, so the last thing I do is I, I check all my eyes before I get out of the house. And I'm even so... Uh, uh, tookie about that is I've actually gone a mile down the road and think I hadn't cut it off and I'll come back and, and make sure again usually I, I've already cut it off. Um, you want to install a smoke alarm in or near your kitchen? 
and two out of every five home fires start in the kitchen. All right, reducing electrical hazards and emergencies. Uh, everybody's seen this before, right? Please avoid that. Uh, you want to avoid that electrical octopus. You don't want to run your cords up under the carpet because of you know, the chance of that catching on fire. Or, you know, you're walking over this carpet all the time. It's going to rub some of that rubber off of, off of your extension cords. Uh, replace broken or frayed cords. Uh, you always want to maintain your appliances. You know, if you've got something that's really old, uh, you know, do yourself a favor. Go ahead and, and, and buy yourself something new because if, if you've got Mama's uh, uh, blender from 1955, it's good to have that, but it's probably got some, uh, some problems in the electrical part of it. Um, you want to uh, know where your power shutoffs are for appliances, circuit breakers, and fuses. Uh, one of the pet peeves that a lot of people have is uh, if you have an electrical box, they, the electricians won't label that on the thing. If you're building a new house or you're getting new electrical uh, things uh, installed, make sure they label so you'll know what switch to cut off. Um, you know, post shutoff directions next to all utilities. You want to know the procedures for turning the power back on as well. That's important. Uh, keep furniture, curtains, dish towels, anything that could catch fire three feet away from any uh, heat source. Three feet from the heat. Um, smoke alarms. About 60% of home fire deaths happen in homes with no smoke, smoking form, smoke, working smoke alarm or no smoke alarms. You want to test the smoke alarms at least once a month. You want to replace those smoke alarm batteries every year. And replace smoke alarms 10 years from the manufactured date. Uh, they've gotten really good and the technology used to. These throwaway ones, you'd have to replace them pretty uh, quickly. But you know, replace your, smart, your smoke alarms 10 years from manufactured date. Um, you want to install those smoke alarms in every sleeping room, on every level, and outside each sleeping area. I even have a uh, smoke alarm in my laundry room. That way, a lot, you know, that, that heat catches some of that uh, fluff on fire. You've got an early warning right there. Uh, a size up, and this is something we do with every emergency. The first thing you want to know, you want to do is to gather facts. Knowledge is power. You got to gather facts, see what's going on with the situation. You want to assess the damage. You wanna, uh, and all this, you're having to do this in split seconds. Sometimes you're doing it and going back and forth, but uh, once you get used to this, you, you uh, get into a, a rhythm. You want to consider the probabilities. You want to assess your situation. It's kind of similar to gathering facts. You're, you're constantly, your mind's constantly rationalizing, uh, you know, processing what you're seeing. Uh, you want to establish pro priorities. Uh, you want to make decisions, there it goes back to assessing and gathering facts. Uh, once you make your decision, you want to de develop a plan of action, you want a strategy, and you take action, and then uh, you evaluate progress. That's you know, similar to gathering facts, assessing your situation, making decisions. It's using information to your, uh, to your benefit. And like uh, the uh, picture says, remember, cert size up is a continual process. Um, it helps us decide whether to attempt to suppress a fire and a plan of action. Uh, <clears throat> do you always want to ask, answer these questions? Do, do me and my buddy have the right equipment? Do you have the right PPE? If you have PPE, use it. It's there for a reason. Uh, are there any other hazards? Uh, when you come up across uh, to a scene and you know you see someone laid out there <clears throat> you don't know what could have happened did they get electrocuted was there uh, some sort of gas or you know what happened so you always got to be looking for other hazards uh, you want to look at the building uh, you know see if it's structurally damaged like Austin uh, pointed out before you always want to take care of yourself so you can help others uh, can me and my buddy escape and uh, Finally, can my buddy and I fight the fire safely? <clears throat> and uh, you'll see this throughout the slides, and I'll, I'll continue to say it. Always remember that the safety of the individual is the top priority. 
uh, some of the firefighting resources, uh, portable fire extinguishers. Uh, even us at the fire department, we have uh, fire extinguishers in our trucks. Uh, wet stand pipes, confinement, and other creative resources. Uh, I can remember we've actually uh, fought a fire on a lake at a camp house, and we were drawing water out of that lake. So that's, you know, you, you've got to think creative when you're fighting fire. Um, some of the uh, fire extinguishers, water, dry chemical, uh, carbon dioxide, and of course, uh, specialized fire extinguishers. Uh, some examples of labels. If you remember, you'll, you'll see a fire extinguisher that kind of gives you, tells you what kind of uh, classification it is, whether dry chemical fire extinguisher. Um, some of the things, and you'll go through this out in the uh, parking lot, you know, the pull, aim, squeeze, uh, sweep, the pass, if you remember, uh, pretty simple. You want to attack that fire at the, the base of it where the fuel is. You don't want to be uh, fighting it up here. You want to be hitting that base. But this is one of those things where <clears throat> it seems simple, but in an emergency, you really want to keep your wits about you and just, you know, just kind of breathe, pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. What are we saying? Safety of individuals is a top priority. Uh, fire suppression is do not. You don't want to get too close to it. Uh, you don't want to try to fight the fire alone. Alone. If, if you've got somebody there with you, get them to help you support as you attack that fire. Uh, don't try to suppress large fires. The most important thing you can do if it's a very large fire is go ahead and call 911 and get those trucks rolling. Uh, you don't want to enter the smoke filled areas. You don't want to do like that guitarist for Great White did. Uh, a guitar, no matter how much it costs, is not worth your life. The fire safety quiz. Okay, a smoke alarm should be replaced 10 years from manufacturer. And a closed door will slow the spread of All of the above. Uh, treating burns, uh, like we've said before, in conducting a thorough size up, you want to. The first thing you want to do is you want to look at the situation. You want to look at the area, make sure it's safe for you to enter that area. Uh, like we've said so many times before, it does the person who's uh, injured no good if you're injured as well. Uh, that means the uh, they've got to rescue two people instead of one person. Uh, you want to treat that area, uh, that uh, treat with first aid. You want to cool that burned area. You want to. You don't want to use ice. You want to cool it uh, with water, or you could take uh, like a clean rag, uh, squeegee it out, and place it on there for no more than a minute. Uh, you want to cover that sterile cloth, cover with a sterile cloth to reduce the risk of infection. That's the main thing about these burns. You don't want foreign objects to get in there, and, and there's a lot of nasty bacteria and things out in the atmosphere. You don't want to get those into your burn. So be sure to cover that with a sterile cloth to protect your uh, injured area against those things. Uh, some of the factors that affect burn severity, uh, the temperature of the burning agent, uh, the time, if you, you know, if, if it's exposed to a longer time, obviously it's going to cause a problem. Uh, the area of body affected, what comes to mind is the face is a very important place if you get burned there. You really want to uh, get medical attention heading your way. Uh, the size of the area burned as well, and of course the depth of the burn. Uh, some burn cla classifications, the superficial, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, affects mainly your, your, your very top layer of skin, uh, which goes to the partial thickness. That's going to be your top layer of skin and a little bit further deeper. And then full thickness, the subcutaneous layer and all layers above that, uh, that's going to be a telltale sign. It's going to be uh, either a white color or a charred color. Uh, you really want to get somebody uh, coming on that. Uh, some of the do's and do nots, uh, like I said before, you do want to cool that skin and clo uh, or clothing if they're still hot. Uh, 
what I, I've said before. Cover burn the burn loosely with dry, sterile dressings to keep air out, reduce pain, and prevent infection. And you want to, uh, as we do with uh, all wounds, you want to elevate those burned extremities. Uh, once again, do not use ice. Uh, don't put uh, ointments or antiseptics or anything on those um, to remedy that. Um, and you also want to remove, you don't want to remove shreds of tissue, break blisters, remove adhered particles of clothing. If you've got a pair of scissors and you really need to get the, uh, the burned in clothing out, the best thing to do is cut that around that and leave the, the little shards of clothing in there. Let the medical professionals take care of that. Um, some inhalation burn signs and symptoms. Uh, it's a more common source of fire-related deaths and burns. 70% uh, of fire-related injuries come from inhalation. Um, it's the number one killer of burn-related, obviously burn-related uh, uh, deaths. Um, symptoms that may develop more than 36 hours after exposure. So the best thing to do is go ahead and get that person to the uh, to the doctor and get them checked out. Um, and like I said, if smoke inhalation is suspected, you know, you want to alert that medical personnel immediately. Time is of the essence. Um, some of the symptoms: sudden loss of consciousness, evidence of respiratory distress or upper airway obstruction, uh, soot around the mouth or nose. If you remember back going back to the uh, the film footage of the fire. Uh, a lot of those people came out with soot around their mouth or nose. Of course, singed, singed facial hair and burns around the face or neck. Um, to, uh, today's summer, you should understand basic fire chemistry, how to mitigate fire risk, keys to effective fire suppression, cert size up and fire safety considerations, the classes of fire and types of fire extinguishers, Distinguishers pass and how to treat burns and smoke and inhalation. And I need two uh, volunteers. All right. Come on down. We're just going to kind of go over a basic thing. Just have a seat right there. All right. I saw that your last patient. Yeah. <laughs> that guy we had to put in the reservoir. Yeah. Well, uh, Normally I have larger uh, gauze pads, but today this is what we're working with. Uh, we're going to very small concentrated burn. Yes, yeah, it's a very small <laughs> concentrated burn. I like it's to a laser burn. <laughs> I like to put something on the uh, burn first, if you would. Ow! Sorry. <laughs> you want to con continuously talk to your patient, make sure that they're you know staying awake and staying aware. Uh, Plus, it kind of calms them down, and we're going to pretend someone else is holding that. Uh, you do not want to wrap it like you would a normal wound. You want to kind of uh, lay it over the thing because you got to remember it's going to hurt. But you, I, the basic thing you're doing right here is uh, creating a, a barrier. You just want to keep it from getting uh, bacteria or anything. Uh, Ways to clean this, we talked about water. Uh, that doesn't mean if you're at the river or lake to use river or lake water. Uh, it's pretty dirty water. Most of the time people are going to have some sort of bottled water. That works fine. Y'all know what fish do in that water, right? <laughs> uh, but there, it, you know, the main thing is keeping those, those foreign, that foreign bacteria out and out of the wound, out of the burn. Uh, and I always follow the safety rules established for certs. What do we say? Personal safety comes first. And thank you for your time. Does anybody have any questions? I know we went through this real quick. I do want to make some points because we went through this the other day. Uh, people see specialized fire extinguisher and their mind immediately goes, I need to get one of those. Specialized fire extinguishers are not something that you're going to find at Lowe's. Those are very particular to a specific threat. Uh, an ABC extinguisher works just fine for around the home. Uh, you know, those class K things for grease fires, that's a special extinguisher. Uh, chemical plants, gas refineries and all that, they have specialized stuff because it's geared for that particular chemical. So you don't have to go overboard with these things. Um, the cords, I did want to mention this. 
How many of you own one of those Walmart, it was $3 yesterday cords? Not $3 10 years ago. It still costs $3 a day. If you want to understand why people tell you not to use one of those things, I invite you to buy one. Don't plug it in. Cut it. And I want you to look and see how much wire is in there. The reason it stays the same price is because they're putting less material in those things. It's not even copper anymore. It's aluminum in there. The more power you pull through that, you have resistance. Resistance causes heat. When you get heat, that's where we get the fire from. Don't go cheap on extension cords. It's coming up on the holiday season. I realize that we like to have nice presentations and so forth, but those are always going to be your weak link. And I, for legal purposes, should say that Walmart is not the only place that you can buy these inferior cords. Um, however, everyone in here understands the generalization. So, uh, anybody else have any questions? What fire extinguishers is placed throughout campus? ABC for the most part, except for in the labs and very specific places. Like I said, an ABC extinguisher is one of those things, it's good for everything, but it's not great for things individually. And that's what it's for. Uh, and they are the larger ones, and they're inspected quite often. Uh, some people do see the tag and say, well, this is past a year. Sometimes it may be a little bit more of a year, uh, beyond a year when they're inspected, but as long as that needle is still in the green, um, they're okay. I, I know we had another question. Somebody? No one else. Well, wasn't the White Snake uh, concert the guy bought cheap insulation? Great White. Okay, so the Great White, the the Station Nightclub, is an extreme example, and I do need to say that up front. Uh, it wasn't that. What it was, they used this material, and it was uh, this went through several lawsuits over who's responsible, this, that, and the other. But the soundproofing material that they'd hung through there so that it wouldn't echo in that building was not fire rate. What it boils down to, they they went cheap on the materials, and that caused that spread. Um, that being said, though, that's no different than the things that we have in our home. Uh, pictures we hang on the wall. I, I think about Christmas decorations and so forth like that. You know, in, in a commercial setting, it's very heavily regulated what you can and can't have on the walls. It's not like that in the home when we have desks with newspapers sitting on them or what have you, cards. That's just as bad. I'm not telling you go home and strip your walls of everything. I am telling you don't go like pyrotechnics in front of it, which is what happened here. And that was part of the lawsuit too as to who knew that they were gonna do that and it went back and forth. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Can you uh, have your fire extinguisher refilled? Or okay, okay, good question. So, if here's the general rule of thumb. If that extinguisher, I believe in, in paying a little more up front for fire extinguishers. If you pay a little more up front, you're buying one that's probably red and it has a metal top. The handle and all that's metal. Those can be refilled. The little plastic ones you buy for seven or eight bucks, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they're smaller volume is another reason that I don't prefer them. I'd always have, rather have more than less. Those are garbage. Once the, the needle turns on, you can throw them away and go buy another one. Um, and I will also say this while we're sitting in here. When it comes to fire extinguisher, the first time you pull that trigger, use all of it. Um, if you just spray a little bit of it and let go, within an hour all the pressure is gone from that thing anyways. It's going to have to be rebuilt regardless. That's just the way they work. Uh, don't ever think, uh, just, I don't want to waste it. So what is that for? Go nuts. It's fine. <laughs> use as much as you think you need to. Now I'm not saying coat everybody around you as fire's out. <laughs> Also, please do not pick up the fire extinguisher and throw it at the fire. That does not work. Uh, that has happened to me once. Uh, but I, I am serious, though. A lot of people that will go, well, I was afraid to use it all. Well, and, and it's, it's very simple. There's a little disc in there. When you squeeze that handle the first time, you're puncturing that pressure disc. Uh, obviously, it's not going to lose all the pressure in five minutes, but within an hour, it's going to be dead anyways. Use as much of it as you think is necessary. Yes, ma'am. There's several companies around town that can do that. Um, I can't recommend one specifically, but if you look at the fire protection companies around here, um, there, there's some out on 25, I know, uh, and, and others. And if they can't do it, they can point you to some. I know there's companies in Columbus that will. Um, it's a matter of repacking um, the material in there and then repressurizing. Now, y'all did see a silver one in these slides. That was a water extinguisher. 
Water extinguishers are different, and I'm not advocating everyone go buy one for the home. Uh, water extinguishers are a great thing, though, if you want to practice with them. Uh, you simply, with a water extinguisher, unscrew the cap, you fill it up with a certain amount of water, screw the cap back on, and you put air in it just like you would a tire. You can use a normal little compressor or go to the gas station. Those are also a little bit cheaper when you look at the volume of them, uh, but they're not going to work on a cooking fire. They're not going to work on a fuel fire. They're only going to work on like wood, paper, things like that, and that's why I don't advocate them. I cannot caution you enough about not putting water on a grease fire. And so I'm going to go sciencey on you and explain what happens. Everybody understands that when water's heated, it turns to steam, right? Well, normally when we have cooking oils in excess of three, four hundred degrees, water boils. Does anybody know the temperature? Two twelve. Two twelve. So we're well above the boiling part, right? When we take water and we spray it. We're injecting that liquid into there. It turns to steam. When steam happens, steam expands. When steam expands, that's what blows the grease everywhere. Um, so yeah, technically you might put the fire out in the pot, but that's because you've blown it all over everything else around you. <laughs> Please avoid that. That's actually where a lot of people get injured in cooking fires. It's not the original fire itself. It's that they take the worst thing invention in this case is the little sprayer at the sink because people will drag that out. <laughs> but it hits that grease and it goes everywhere and that's where we see the most burns. And that's why they're always to the hands, the chest, the face is where that stuff. Usually, you know, I know you grew up on the throw flour, baking soda on it or put a lid on it. And that's certainly fine. If you can do that safely, that works. Uh, but of all else, use an extinguisher on it. Do not mount the extinguisher right next to the stove because if you need to get to it and the stove's burning, it's going to be kind of difficult. But you can always clean up an extinguisher versus letting your house burn down. And you can see in that video, and I realize it's a really quick example, if someone had taken an extinguisher, the extinguisher that they would have had to have had in that building, they could have put that fire out in the first 30 seconds. But everybody scrambled and ran. And that's unfortunate what happened. But that's all goes back to, and it doesn't have to be on paper, making mental notes, preparing that if this goes wrong, what am I going to do? Uh, in the fire service, I hope they taught this where you were. No, it wasn't me that taught you. <laughs> we teach our guys even driving the truck. You know, if somebody was to pull out in front of you, where are you going to put that truck? That's supposed to be going through their mind the whole time. Am I going in the ditch? Am I going this way? You know, constantly reevaluating if this goes wrong, what am I going to do? I'm not telling you to go out there and be paranoid. I'm telling you to go out there and be smart. Any other questions? How long, uh, is that an expiration date or how long could you keep a fire extinguisher? Fire extinguishers, as long as they're in good shape and they're still showing pressure. I'm talking about the metal ones. I, again, am not a fan of the plastic ones. Uh, fire extinguishers, as long as they're not rusted out or something like that, uh, I have no problem as long as it's still in the green. Now, after about five or ten years, I think it's a good idea to take it outside and just test it. Let, or let somebody learn how to use one, you can either get that and refill or buy another one. But as long as that needle's staying in the green, that thing's good because that's a solid pressure indicator in there. Uh, now, if you hang one in the shop after five or ten years, uh, I will say this, we live in dirt dauber country. <laughs> Check the nozzle. <laughs> those little jokers like to burrow here and build those nests everywhere you want think. Uh, you think I'm kidding. If you paint that thing on the wall and never touch it again, <laughs> You're going to be really disappointed when you actually need it. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Uh, all we'll do is we'll go downstairs. Uh, usually we'll have one person inside using the extinguisher and then two more ready to go, and we'll rotate through there. Uh, now we're here as long as you want us to be. If you do it one time you want to do it again, uh, if you don't mind letting other folks go through there first, we'll stick around just as many times as you want. we got three quarters of gas in the generator, so we can be here for a while. All right. Thank y'all. Kitchen fires, we, we said earlier, this is the normal place it happens, right? A lot of times it happens in the oven. Oh, not yet. So, there's really, this is actually the easiest one to do simply because all you have to do is turn the power off. You don't want to open the door because you're letting more oxygen in there, right? We'll just kill it there. You know, that's all you have to do is remove the heat. The oven is designed to take that heat. Just leave it there. But let's say we let it burn for a while. And then, you know, it sits there and it burns and burns and burns and burns. We don't catch it in time. And you want to you keep your house clean? What? Keep your house clean? You have kids? Do they keep your house clean? They're supposed to. But do they? No. In this case, they, didn't, they haven't been cleaning here. 
So this is heated and it's caused this to ignite or something all the time is working, right? So this is where we run into a problem because you can't really reach over this to kill the power here, right? And that's where the smoke or fire extinguisher comes in. So what did we say? We said pass. Pull the pin, aim, squeeze, and sweep. So let's start. We'll pull the pin. All right. Aim your nozzle. Squeeze at the base of the fire here is what we're looking to do. Get in there with you. There you go. Alright. Now we want to turn off the oven, which is the button here. In the real setting, you would know where your off button is here on the oven. Now, this is reignited. You're going to put it out. It appears the oven's put out. And you're upset with your children, but you still have a house to come home to. It's just that simple. You just have to think about what you're doing. Don't just rush. Because if you spray it all down here, that's not going to do anything. you got to get to what's actually burning. The pot roast is done. <laughs> Any questions? All right. Who's next? You have two different ways we have a fire here. We can have an oven fire or a stove fire. Oven fire is easy. Remember the fire triangle we talked about? Oven fire, all we need to do is remove the heat. We don't want to open the door because we're letting in oxygen and so forth. We just need to remove the heat, which would be killing the fire. So in this instance, just kill into it. And obviously it takes a moment. It's not a big deal. The fire goes out. The problem we run into, though, is if we don't catch it immediately or something else is burning here, we may have a fire up top. That's a little bit different because we're not going to reach over this to get to the control panel. Which is where the old handy fire extinguisher comes in. So do you remember the pass? Pull the pin, aim, squeeze, and sweep. Now where is the fuel with this fire? Remember because we're aiming for where the fuel is. We're not aiming for the smoke or the pot. Be under here. That's where the fuel is. So go ahead and walk through the motion. Pull the pin. There you go. Aim your nozzle. Just pull out a clip there. Get ready to squeeze it. Aim for the fuel. There you go. So now you would come up here, kill the power, whoop, and let off again. Is that again? Feel good? There you go. Kill the power again. Back up front. Check and see if it reignites. That's it. Okay. Any questions? It's not that bad, is it? You just got to keep your head. Ah, uh, yes.